Welcome everyone. Uh, thanks all for coming along. I think there are still some people filtering in, um, but hopefully uh, people will, will arrive within the next couple of seconds and we can get started. Um, in the meantime, I just wanted to say hello and welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is uh, Rebecca Rumble. Many of you I will have met at various Tic Tacs in the past, uh, but if you don't know me, um, I'm currently the Director of Research uh, for My Society, um, and we are the uh, creators of the Tic Tac program, which looks into the impacts of civic technology, normally uh, pre-COVID times uh, in an in-person conference, but Given, uh, given the times we live in, we are migrating a lot of our activity online for the moment. So just to uh, let you all uh, know housekeeping, um, today's surgery is being recorded. Um, we are taking minutes um, and we're gonna publish those minutes on the website, the Tic Tech website, which hopefully you've all um, visited already. Um, please do, if you want to tweet, um, the hashtag TicTech um, is, is our hashtag of choice. We understand that after 18 months of doing absolutely everything online, um, that you might be a bit camera weary. Uh, so if you do want to turn your camera off at any point, that's fine. Um, we won't be offended. I will keep mine on uh, while we're talking so that you can see me. Um, but yeah, no, no obligation and no judgment if you, you're not feeling camera ready today, no problem at all. Just to let you know, because we've got a few different platforms that, that we're using today uh, for this surgery, the Zoom chat, that the chat function within Zoom, that's just for informal chat. So obviously, you know, feel free to interact in there but we're not going to be monitoring that chat to input into the questions or into the, the kind of main body of the, of the work that we're doing. All of that's going to be done in Padlet, uh, which the link of which you should have, uh, Gemma should have sent that to you. So again, feel free, you know, general chit chat in the Zoom chat, but if you want to, to ask questions or if you want to raise kind of substantial points, for discussion, please do that in the Padlet as we go along. So that's our housekeeping. Um, just to, to let you know a bit about the Tic Tech program before, before we start off. As I said, it, it used to just be one annual in-person event where we'd all get together and we'd look at impacts and, and look at projects and look at research. Um, and it was super fun. But and I'm, and I'm not sure about the rest of you here, but personally and, and within civil society, um, a few people that I've been speaking to, we really miss not just going to, to the big conferences and, and seeing people and, and going to the sessions. One of the things that we feel like we've really lost are those wonderful random conversations that you have with people during the coffee breaks. Um, the, the, the really kind of interesting chats that you have between when the sessions are going on, um, where you can either meet people or speak to people that you already know, you can kind of maintain those relationships, but you can kind of just sort of say, well, what's going on in your world? Um, you know, how is it going? What, what are the big things that are, that are challenging you? What is, what, what's worrying you? What's been a big win recently? You know, the, these kind of rather informal um, but very informative interactions um, that you just you simply don't get at an online conference or, or an online seminar. Um, and, you know, whilst we've tried to keep the Tic Tech tradition alive by, by doing kind of short seminars and short presentations, you know, you lose an awful lot of meaningful interaction if you're just sitting in front of a computer screen listening to someone. Uh, those those wonderful conversations that happen during the coffee breaks or when you go for a beer afterwards, you know, a lot of the time, those are where the, the really great, really great relationships begin. So we've developed the, the Tic Tech Labs program to try and recapture a little bit of that. We, we realize that nothing will ever come close to, to being able to, to sit down with people face to face and, and have a organic conversation. 
Um, but we we are trying in some small way to recapture a little bit of that over the next kind of year to 18 months where I suspect travel is still going to be a little bit difficult, um, especially for, for the kind of global audience and the global network that we have interested in this. So the, the concept of the, you know, the concept we're, we're following, um, we're gonna have these regular civic tech surgeries. That's what this is, welcome to the first one. Apology if, if it looks a, a little nascent or, or not quite <laughs> not, not quite um, as polished as, as it should be. This is the first one, so we're, we're very much learning. Um, the, the surgeries are about exploring an, an unearthing um, some of the, the issues in civic tech um, so that we can start figuring out how to address them. And, you know, lots of new stuff, I'm sure, has come up over the last year and a half as well that was that's completely new stuff that all completely new takes on old issues um that there's there's so very much that's happened i imagine um that lots of people have experienced lots of new things and would love to to kind of discuss them um the topic of today is public and private uh, collaborations and partnerships how smaller civic tech organizations like my society, like, like many of you here today, um, can start or maximize their collaboration with public and private organizations because those being able to partner with those kinds of organizations often enables you to kind of amplify your impact. Um, but it's not always easy. It's not always obvious how to do that well, how to do it meaningfully, um, how to do it impactfully without compromising you know your organization or without running yourself into the ground so there's, there's lot there's lots i think to to kind of share lots of knowledge um to to pass around on that subject our themes for all of these civic tech surgeries have been um put together by our program steering group we have a wonderful steering group. The, uh, the information is on our Tic Tech website on each of the steering group members. Um, but yeah, we basically had a, did a little bit of research. We had a lot of conversations about kind of identifying big themes that I think are of interest uh, and that hopefully are important to, to the rest of the community. So that's how we've landed on this today. There will be other civic tech surgeries um, over the coming months that look at uh, some other areas. So we have basically in this session, we're going to have a little bit um, of discussion. Um, we've invited some, some researchers and some practitioners along so that they can kind of get the, the, the juices flowing. They're going to start off having a very short discussion. We're not doing presentation so it's not like sit there listen and and then go away you know these these introductory thoughts are very much supposed to kind of get things moving start hopefully sparking ideas um, and discussions that we can then take into the padlet and and hopefully capture lots and lots of really interesting things that are concerning you that you that are of interest to you um, and that hopefully we will then take away to uh, workshops to actually distill down a bit, to crystallize, to figure out, okay, these are things that if we if we can commission this kind of research or if we can develop some learning materials on these things, this will be a benefit to the community. Um, so as I said, um, those, those workshops will happen afterwards. So they'll be a little bit more precise based on all of the information we get here today. Um, they will be a lot smaller groups, probably, well, definitely fewer than 10 people. Um, and people will, anyone here, anyone not here, but who wanted to be here, anyone interested uh, can apply to be part of those specific working groups if they are really interested in, in digging more into this um, and maybe in kind of taking up uh, some of the work that, that we hope to, to do as part of the programme. So Gemma, uh, who is in engineering everything at the moment behind the scenes while I'm rambling on, Gemma will provide all of the details um, for, for how to apply for those and timings and everything as we go through. So that's enough of me talking. Um, I would, I'm so happy we've got some amazing discussants uh, with us today. Um, so we've got 
Alina from uh, Citizen Lab, where she is head of government relations and also the co-founder. So very welcome to you, Aline. We have, we have Abtaj Khan uh, from Code for Pakistan. Uh, he is the government information lead. Thank you for, very much for joining us. Thanks um, for having me. We have Gabriella Rizzano, um, who is director and co-founder of Open Up in South Africa. Hi, Gabby. Hi. And last but not least, we have Amanda Clark, who is associate professor at Carlton University. Welcome, Hello. Amanda. So thank you all very, very much for joining us. I'm just gonna fire off some questions and let you guys um, start the discussion. So let's kick off. Um, let's kick off, I mean, this one's maybe aimed at Eileen, um, Abdahaj and Gabby. So what dilemmas have you faced or are you currently facing when working on public or private civic tech collaborations? Over to you. You're all being very polite, aren't you? And, and expecting someone else to go first. Okay, <laughs> let's let's go Aline, M. Tahaj, and then Gabby. Is that okay? <laughs> if you could just give about maybe three minutes each, that'd be lovely. Yeah, yeah, I think we were, um, I mean, no one wanted to go first, basically. Um, so yeah, my name is uh, Aline, I'm one of the co-founders at, at Citizen Lab, um, and we've built a civic um, engagement platform uh, that is mainly used by, by local governments to engage their constituents and citizens on, on many uh, different topics. Um, we now work in, I think, more than 15 countries. We started in uh, in Belgium, uh, but we're active in, in different European countries, but also more and more in the Americas, both Latin and, and, uh, and North America. Um, so yeah, I think we've, uh, we've done this now for over the, over the past six years. Um, and I think not many um, dilemmas or challenges have, have changed. I think they're still uh, quite the same than, than when we got started. Um, and I'll just list a few, right? I've, uh, I've, I have a bullet list of, of a few items. So I guess, first of all, um, I saw also that someone introduced this in the chat. Um, I think like public-private partnerships or collaborations, you can so interpret them in, in different ways, but I guess like we often really work in like the contractor um, type of collaboration, right? Uh, we'll be a supplier of, of, of software and we work with uh, the governments um, as they are our clients. So I guess one of the first dilemmas or challenges is always procurement. How do you get in? How do you get this collaboration started? Um, how do you make sure that, um, I mean, you get paid for, for what you're doing? Uh, but of course, procurement can be quite uh, of a long and, and difficult process. I can't think we can further go into that uh, later. Um, then when uh, one of the dilemmas we're also facing is like, we want to get to value quick and impact quick. Like I also work on impact at Citizen Lab. So how can we make sure that our platform is used in, in a good way um, that we get to impact fast, but then we kind of easily face um, very silo structured, as we all know, uh, governments. Um, we work with local governments, but even there, although they can sometimes be pretty small, like mid-sized cities of 50,000 inhabitants, you'll still have like those very silo structured um, organizations, no matter which topic, right? We work a lot on urban planning, mobility, climate. Uh, so you kind of always come in uh, within one department, whereas you actually want to have impact on the whole organization. Um, and so that's often a dilemma, right? Like how much do you invest in like a good internal organization, making sure that they take the lead on things, but not spending like months and years before getting to, to any, uh, any results. Um, and then last is like my third point could be um, just a general understanding of, of software and uh, software as a, as a service. Uh, we all work in, in, in technology um, and there's more and more interest in technology, I guess, definitely also in the past year and months, people have been, I mean, there has been a huge push um, in digitization, but still 
in our, I mean, we are software as a service, um, so they still kind of expect a lot of, um, yeah, customizations. There's not too much understanding of, of how software is often built. So what can be easily done, what cannot be done. Um, so, so that's also sometimes difficult because like our key contact people don't really understand how to adjust things, how it's built, uh, how we are facing decisions. Um, so those are, I think, like the three main uh, dilemmas. Yeah. Thanks very much, uh, Okay. Um, so yeah, I think um, I, I just briefly uh, mention what Code for Pakistan is and uh, then come to the dilemma. So Code for Pakistan, for all of uh, all of you who do not know what Code for Pakistan is, uh, we are not, not for profit and um, we basically work uh, on bridging the gap between citizens and the government in Pakistan through technology. Um, and we've been working with various uh, public and private sector organizations over the past seven years. Um, uh, and specifically with the government, we mostly help them improve their public services as well as this, um, their business processes through our fellowship program. And uh, um, on the other hand, we try to empower, educate and mobilize the community through our hackathons and civic innovation labs. Um, so when, as I mentioned, we've been working with the public and private sector over, over the past seven years now. And um, again, uh, it's not easy uh, to, to work uh, in, in a public and private sector setting. Uh, and obviously all of it comes with its own set of challenges. And we recently did publish, a, I mean, a couple of years ago, we did publish a research paper on the learnings and the outcomes that we've had so far from, from the, our fellowship program. But um, today I'll just briefly talk about just a few or the major ones that um, I can think of um, right now. So I think the first and the and the foremost challenge that we faced is, is to build that understanding around civic tech and making people understand, making the public sector as well as the private sector understand what civic tech is. Uh, whenever you go out there, you meet someone, uh, you pitch to them what you do and they come back to you. Oh, okay. So you, you are, you develop softwares, don't you? And that's, that's the sort of feedback that you get from, from, um, uh, from the public and private sector. So, uh, and I don't blame them for that because I think uh, they are used to such a setting where uh, they generally interact with such services, um, such people who, uh, who think the only value, uh, only value that technology adds is through developing software solutions through websites or through uh, mobile applications. And they do not think out of the box uh, on how to add value by co-creating solutions. Uh, then the, the second challenge that we basically recently, I think we recently um, identified is, but something that we've been working on uh, for the past seven years, and but is, that we generally as a whole, as a nation or as a community or the public as well as the private sector, we do not understand what our problems are to the core. Uh, so for example, we recently conducted a GovTech innovation challenge where we crowdsourced problem statements from the, from the public, uh, just asking them to list down what the biggest problems they're facing. Uh, we did get some very interesting um, problem statement from the public, but then most of them were uh, very basic. So one of the problem statements, if, if I can say, was about that there is noise pollution and that there's a noise in a certain area of a city, right? But then uh, if you dissect it further, you will notice that that is, I mean, that from, from a public's perspective that or a uh, perspective from, from organizations, that might be a problem, but when you dissect it, you, you should be able to list down why is the noise, why is the noise pollution there, right? So it can be due to many reasons. It can be due to, let's say there's excessive traffic there, there's urbanization, there's um, in, increase in population, there, there are factories there. So there, there can be multiple reasons. And then when you dissect it further, then you come to know, so 
for example, if the traffic is the major cause of causing noise pollution, then uh, how or why the, why is the traffic there? So is it because there is lack of traffic infrastructure or if there is la lack of traffic HR, traffic wardens, is it because the lanes, the traffic lanes, they are narrower? So, so I think in general, we still need to understand what, what our problems are. Uh, and that's one of the challenges that we face. We, uh, we've been trying to work on that, on that, but this is something that we recently uh, have started working on. And then uh, again, something that um, Elena also spoke about um, is building trust within the government. So again, when you go to them, you pitch to them, the, the questions start coming in. Why are you here? Uh, why are you trying to help us? Uh, and again, when we talk about then accountability and increasing efficiency, then uh, that is a big question mark because uh, they come back to us by saying, why are you doing that? Uh, why do you want our, our data to be published, right? So questions like that. And um, uh, the, these, are, the, these are some of the challenges that we face. And the last one that I'll, I'll briefly talk about is uh, the adoption of civic tech solutions over time, adoption, maintenance, uh, basically. So whenever you, or a CSO or, or the organizations uh, work on, on a certain product or service and they offer it to, to the community, to the whoever the stakeholders are. Um, so ensuring that that solution is being used, uh, I think that is a huge challenge. So developing technology is not the hardest part here, but um, ensuring that that uh, the solution is sustained over time is, is a major barrier here. So just to, again, give you a small example, uh, we've worked on developing an open data portal here in uh, Pakistan for, for a government agency. And um, it has been there for the past two years. Uh, we've uploaded a couple of thousands of data sets to the, uh, to the portal, but it has not been launched yet just because of bureaucratic hurdles. They just want policies to be in place before launching a technology. So, so these are some of the challenges that I can think of uh, on top of my mind right now. Yeah. Thanks, Al-Zahar. Kavi, what are your thoughts? Uh, I have them written down. Um, so oh, just to also flag in South Africa, we had we're having load shedding. So I might randomly disconnect at full, but I'll come back on. It's some of the exciting, exciting experiences we have here. Uh, so I am the director of Open Up. We're a civic tech lab based in Cape Town. Uh, we've been around since about 2013. Um, and we work on using data technology and innovation methods, actually. So not just data and technology, but innovation methods for activating citizens for positive social change, largely in a South African context. Um, but I've also been involved um, in research and law and policy at a regional level. Um, so I'll, I can talk to two different areas. One of them is public-private partnership, partnerships in the context of our experiences and undertaking them. And then the other is looking more at public-private partnerships at a policy and the national level and some of the challenges, particularly for South Africa um, from that perspective. I'll do it really quickly though. Um, but we've done civic tech uh, projects at both um, national and uh, local government level. Um, so that's really interesting. Um, but, you know, you see the capacity challenges uh, running through all, all of the spheres of government, to be honest. Um, but, you know, I think they, to maybe talk more to another side of things, there's, there's largely, there's often a conflict, a substantive conflict and a procedural conflict or methodological conflict that arises when you're trying to undertake public-private partnerships. I mean, the methodological one is, you know, for organizations like ours, which are, you know, very 
spiritually connected to sort of agile development, you know, and agile methodologies, it's very difficult to implement those uh, projects in contexts which are, you know, entirely waterfall um, and, and they just, um, you know, a lot of entities just don't know how to work that way. What it does lead to too, uh, sort of a substantive complex often between, you know, us trying to seek to create a kind of impact and our, our public our partners very fundamentally being focused on, on, you know, the performance of certain deliverables, whether or not those achieve impacts. Um, and I'm talking very loosely, I suppose, but, you know, we've seen it in a project that we've just been implementing quite torturously over a two month period where, you know, it's more important than sort of sort of activities are being implemented or deliverables are being uh, produced for national government that we know aren't going to have an impact with the local government actors that it's meant to capacitate because there's been no attempt to get buy-in from the local government partners by national government, something that we raised from the beginning, you know, and it's obviously very, it's the antithesis of how we see work actually needing to happen, but in a two month period, it's it's been, it's been a sacrifice that we've had to just um, suck up <laughs> and deal with, you know, but we, we take our own lessons and we, and we learn how to deal with those. Some of the, the strategies we use are to try and, you know, we tend to like, a longer process so that we can sort of onboard and create cultures of, of sharing between us and our partners. We've seen that work with government quite well, like in the launching of Villa Kamali, but I mean, that was a project that spanned. So that was um, National Treasury's open budget portal, but you know, that's a project that spanned about three years, you know, and so you can afford to invest in building relationships that mean you can work more collaboratively, um, but that's not always possible. I think it's also you can construct your contracts very well and craftily. Um, you know, we always, um, as part of our pitches, we always ensure that we make very clear how we work and what our methodology is within our, our, our tendering process. So within our proposals, we make it very clear how we produce our work. Um, and in contracting, we try and contract two deliverables that are tied to impact and not necessarily product, although that can be very difficult to negotiate, but it's, it's a practical strategy that you can use. Um, then if you, I mean, if you turn more broadly to sort of some of the bigger issues um, in public-private partnerships at a local level, I've added in a little case study there I did on some of the digital hegemonies that exist in relation to public-private partnerships that we saw expressed in, in sort of COVID-19 related surveillance technologies um, in South Africa that can be a little instructive um, because the reality is particularly in South Africa, but you do see it regionally, that the in-house capacities uh, or the public sector capacities uh, for both using agile methodologies, but also implementing technologies are necessarily there, although I don't like to be um, the person who says that in a condescending way, it's just a practical reality of, of what we've seen. And a lot of that is not a prioritization of technical skills uh, within public service departments, um, which is, you know, something that needs to happen in order for these kinds of dependencies or codependencies uh, that exist between um, government and private sector partners um, um, existing um, and resulting in terrible, like very negative things like vendor lock-in, uh, which you see with a lot of technology projects. Um, and you know, the repetition or the repeated use of, of partners for the delivery of products who aren't focused on, on public service or, or, you know, public outcomes. Um, and I mean, you saw that have devastating results um, in South African, uh, in the South African national context, when the outsourcing of social grants, the distribution of social grants was outsourced to a private sector partner um, and, and the conflict that arose there. A lot of that relates to procurement and a lot of that, you know, I think for us as 
civic tech advocates and I mean certainly from our perspective because we work so much on transparency you know there you know there are long-term advocacy interventions that need to happen in procurement transparency um, which are necessary not just for the greater good, you know, um, like, and transparency as a good, but also for implementing more successful social innovation. So that's my touch. Thank you very much, all of you, really thoughtful um, and, and detailed discussions there. Um, just to kind of keep the ball rolling, but keep it hopefully rolling towards a, a very positive destination. Um, just ask, I'm just curious as to what you think might help you address some of those issues. I mean, obviously, you all talked about like a whole spectrum of things there. So I'm not expecting a, a unified theory of how to fix everything. Um, but are there are there small fixes? Are there, are there small things or are there actually gaps that you just think, look, I, we don't even know enough about the problem. We know there's a problem and we know a bit about the problem um but i think one of the one of the themes running through what quite a lot of you are saying is that a lot of the problems at, at our specific end of things are kind of the result of institutional or other other kinds of issues that are kind of inside some of these organizations or, or uh, governments so are there any things that you think either a that you you have been doing or you have identified that, that could be solutions or b are there areas where you'd think well i really wish someone would go away um like uh and do some research into this so that we actually understand it better so we can uh so we can look at it better you know are there, are there resource gaps there anywhere um do you want to do you want to go back the other way this time go gabby up to house and aline <laughs> keeping it exciting, moving it around. I was just playing with my hair. Um, so I mentioned some of the, you know, practical things we do, like with contracting, for instance. I think another thing, which is like, we found as a strategy, which is like a gentle strategy for bringing people in to a space which can focus a lot more on impact than, than just uh, deliverables. Although, you know, I know also a lot of those, that focus on waterfall and deliverables has to do with how government budgets work. And there's not a lot you can do around that, you know, um, you know, fiscal dumping. You just want to be on the positive end of fiscal dumping, um, which sounds hilarious when I say it. And um, so I think, you know, another thing that we like strategy we found quite useful is to always make sure we put within budget space for user-centered research and to really emphasize user-centered research um, in the creation of our products, because we find it's often a gentler way of, of steering people towards, you know, higher impact. It's not to say, you know, Open Up wants to do the projects this way, but it's to say, you know, we, we've spoken to users and these are what the users are needing. And I mean, we know it's both better from a, you know, an innovation design, but we also find it a useful kind of political tool because it kind of de-emphasizes it. It, 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 yeah, it sort of reduces conflict. It doesn't seem like we have competing interests. What we instead say, we focus on the citizen or user and say that these are what those interests use. So we find that a very useful strategy. I think there's a little person who just <laughs> like an evil hobbit. And then, um, so yeah, that would be some practical advice and I think works for us. Thanks Gabby, really useful. I'm to house. Yes, thanks. Uh, uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, it's somewhat similar to what Gabby just mentioned and um, just going to her uh, point earlier. So since we've been working here for the past seven years now and um, we've had our own share of learnings as well and we've tried to adopt to the challenges that we face. So, I mean, I, I earlier spoke about uh, the government officials, the, the private and the public institutions not entirely understanding the concept of civic tech. Uh, and through now through our fellowships, that is one of the important components that we've identified and it's a part of the curriculum there now, where we not only train the fellows on what civic tech is and how the process works, uh, we also try to encourage 
the public office holders to be a part of those boot camps, be a part of those sessions so that they can also learn uh, how all of this works. Um, um, so, so just trying to instill the spirit of civic tech uh, throughout the, uh, the public sector. Um, I mean, we, we cannot do that entirely, but we, we are trying in bits and pieces to, to educate some of them to the extent that we can. Um, and, and I mean, the, the end goal is trying to empower the staff um, so that they can, instead of waiting for or, or following someone, they can go and be those change makers rather than following someone. Uh, and we've, we've seen the results um, already. So uh, in one of the pro provinces that we work a lot in is the Khyber-Portunqua province. And now after seven years, I can see a clear difference in the understanding of how they used to interpret what civic tech was and now how, how they uh, interpret it now and how they are now leading the change themselves. And they come to us with requests uh, for that we need help with X, Y, Z. Um, and then uh, Gabi also mentioned that user research. Um, and we, again, we specifically focus a lot on conducting user research and identifying the problem to the code before taking on anything. Uh, and that's, again, a part of the curriculum that we have, the fellowship curriculum that we have. And again, that is being taught not only to the fellows, but also to the government and public sector employees. And, um, uh, and, and then, I mean, in, entirely, this, this is not only just educating them, but to build the capacity within the government and the public sector. Uh, and just giving them the confidence to, to take on challenges, challenges themselves uh, to, be, to bring that change. Uh, and then just giving them some, some success stories um, out of the fellowship program. So initially when we started, I remember we, uh, whenever we used to go and pitch to the government, uh, we gave them examples from the likes of Code for America, from, code for, from, from the broader Code for All community, I, I'd say. But now since we've, we have a, a couple of success stories from within um, Code for Pakistan, so that, that motivates them. Um, and uh, they are now more into uh, co-creating solutions with, it, with the public, with the citizens, rather than just uh, working on the problems themselves and building solutions around them. Uh, and then one other thing that we've uh, learned along the way is um, to build with all the stakeholders. So again, as Gabby mentioned, that they also work in a very agile environment, but the government is generally not used to working in an agile environment. So now we are again trying to make them work in that agile environment, if even if they are not inclined um, towards it. So our fellows go there. We ensure that uh, our fellows, the teams, uh, wh whoever is working on a certain product, they go and they uh, work with them. They give them regular updates. They uh, follow the the release early and release uh, often concept and just give them something so that they can feel the ownership of whatever they, uh, the department is working on. And then lastly, something again, related to the inspiration is storytelling, which we've been focusing on lately is, uh, is just to tell, is, is to make them learn how to tell stories as well as uh, our, we as as code for pakistan we've also been been started doing that um and uh, so yeah i mean i mean that those are just some of the things that we've done we've learned along the way and uh, we are trying to implement them i mean um in maybe not to the extent that we can but uh, we we've started tr we we've we, we are trying our best to, to bring the change um, within the public and private sectors um, through the work that we do. Thanks, Emsaz. Uh, I, love, I love it when anyone's trying to uh, get the spirit of civic tech into public sector bodies. It warms my heart. <laughs> um, Alina, do you, want to, uh, do you want to discuss your thoughts as well? Um, yeah, so I think I um, I really follow what what has just been been said over the past uh, 
15, 20, 20 minutes, I think we, we see the, the recurring challenges. And um, I, I just want to share some of the, of the small things uh, we're also doing. I think what Gabby mentioned and what I've also seen in the chat is like putting those impact goals into contracts and trying to make that very measurable um, in a collaboration is, I think, key. Unfortunately, we haven't seen it that much in, uh, in procurement, right? I mean, they might like at the beginning of a tender, there might be the goal, but then in the end, it's not really measured uh, along the way. So what we try to do is to, to make it measurable. So I just put it in, in the chat. Uh, we, um, I mean, we try to also communicate our theory of change to the governments we're working with. And we we're trying to say like, okay, this is the SDG we're working on. This is how it uh, boils down to indicators. That's how we measure it. That's how you are performing compared to other governments. Uh, this is where you can work on. Um, so I guess, I mean, it's it's pretty difficult, but we try to to bring it into, into government to start measuring um, their, their progress and, and have that basically as a steering wheel um, for, for what's next and, and, and what's important. Then two, I guess, is like building capacity, same thing. Um, it's really key to connect people with, with each other. Um, we often identify like uh, the real ambassadors and like the people within the government that get things done. Um, and it doesn't at all depend on hierarchy, right? It can be a trainee that comes in or it can be whoever. Um, and we try to connect these people to each other. Um, and we've really seen that working. If we invest in the community and if we see like, okay, that person, they might not have the skills today, but let's connect them with someone who has a similar position in another country, um, but they're doing pretty well, then we can see that investing in them and mainly connecting them with each other uh, really helps in, in in, in building uh, that that capacity, so I guess like community building is is really key. It's great also to have many people here today, but would be interesting to to also have more people from from government so that they participate and that they also learn about our our challenges and it's very transparent that we can have that space and not just like the in in the more contractual um, relationship. And then I guess last but not least is also like. Um, I think uh, Abitash also mentioned it. It's like, how do you make sure that there's sustainability in the in the initiatives that that you're launching? How do you go uh, beyond just pilots? I think pilots are important to test things and to be innovative, uh, but then you do need to have that long term uh, commitment. So. And that, that's often a dilemma, right? Like you need to be able to be flexible during the contract, but still have a long-term collaboration to, to have that sustainability. Um, so that's what we've been, been doing from the beginning. Like we really say like, okay, we try to say no as much as possible now to short-term contracts because it's just like we know that there's just such a risk that will do work that then later um, is not being continued because of often also changes in, in political leadership, um, elections, right, are often what, like, uh, we work with, with local governments, someone comes in, we've been doing great work over a few years, and then they're like, okay, let's change everything now. Um, so, so that can be really uh, frustrating. I think an awful lot of people on this call will share those frustrations and those experiences. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you all so much for that. Um, really, really interesting discussion so far. I'm conscious that, you know, people have been listening, people have been chatting a little bit informally on the Zoom, um, but we have our full Padlet up um, online. Uh, Gemma has, uh, there she goes, she has just shared the link again in, in the chat. Um, we have so many people here with so much experience, so many different interests. Um, lots of experimentation uh, around these themes under their belts. It would be fantastic if we could maybe take about five minutes right now. Um, obviously, give all of our speakers a, a little bit of a break um, in case anyone needs a very quick comfort break. That's fine. Um, but yeah, if we take about five minutes now, it'd be great if everyone could, could jump on the Padlet. There are these questions um, that we've been discussing on there. Um, as I said earlier, everything that, that we can get from you guys now in terms of ideas, in terms of identifying issues, 
in terms of identifying things that you need uh, as civic tech organizations um, that would help you uh, go uh, in your work going forward. Um, throw, throw all those things uh, under the right headings on the Padlet. We'd be really grateful. Um, and it will, as I say, it will inform a lot of the, the other work that the project does from now on. Uh, so it is, well, it's 2.47 where I am. I know we have a truly global audience here, so I'm not exactly sure where it is, where you are, what it is, where you are. Uh, but if you, if you take five minutes now um, and we'll come back uh, and continue the conversation. Um, so thanks everyone, see you in five. And that's your five minutes, everyone. We have the uh, excellent timer here to keep us on track. Thank you, Gemma. Uh, and thank you all for your contributions to, to the Padlet. As I say, we really appreciate all of your thoughts. Um, it, it's going to be incredibly useful uh, going forward. So yeah, excellent. And the Padlet is open as we go. So please, you know, if you have other thoughts, if you if you have other things that you want to contribute while people are speaking, if something just clicks, you know, light bulb goes off, please throw it in there. Um, it's all going to be it's all going to be massively useful for us. Um, so we are very lucky uh, that Gabby is wearing two hats today as a practitioner and as a researcher. She's produced some fabulous uh, policy and, and other research items that are available online. Gabby, feel free to share them around. Um, and we also have Amanda Clark joining us, um, who is a professor at Carlton University. Amanda has done a lot of research uh, around these kinds of uh, themes. So it's going to be great to have her thoughts as well. Um, so I suppose, you know, that lo loads of themes and loads of uh, things have already come out here today. Um, I suppose, can, can we maybe just like reflect a little bit? We've had, you know, we've been going for about an hour now. So Amanda, maybe do you want to kind of jump in, give us your thoughts, um, especially around things like, because I've noticed on the Padlet, no, no one's putting any, oh, there's definitely a great piece of research about this that we could all learn from. Um, so maybe you could uh, enlighten us or, or talk maybe more broadly about the, the kind of, uh, these kinds of themes that, that come up in your work. Thank you. Um, I have to say, I'm like thoroughly enjoying the conversation today. I've really missed the Tic Tac community. So this is great. Thanks for bringing us all together. And it's so nice as a researcher to have the opportunity to learn from those working in the field. And um, it's sort of like, it feels like I'm doing my research while I'm just sitting here, just vicariously listening to you. So I was quite captivated by everyone's interventions. Um, I think in terms of the existing evidence base, one of the things is that history is repeating itself in many ways. Um, in the area of uh, public administration research that looks at co-production, procurement, public-private partnerships, which is a pretty long-standing um, field of research. And I think really a lot of that work started getting going in the 70s and 80s, in particular as governments started to look um, more to kind of external actors to partner with for service delivery or for policy design, um, the researchers started uncovering a lot of the same issues that we're hearing about today. So um, issues of, you know, government um, contracting requirements being too onerous, um, about uh, sort of accountability regimes and government being difficult to square with the reality of limited resources in some of the nonprofit sectors, um, or nonprofit sector organizations, um, and sort of the strict hierarchies and silos of government making it difficult to find access points and to um, sort of more organically develop relationships. Um, and especially I think the point around kind of shifting governments, not just um, changes in government making it difficult to sustain projects and build relationships, but also just internal movement of civil servants, um, making it, you know, the person you used to connect with on a certain issue is suddenly no longer, um, suddenly no longer working in that role. And it's like, there's this gap and like, who do I contact now? Right. So um, a lot of history repeating itself. I think the question is, um, what can we draw from that research to improve practice today? And part of I think what might be a little bit depressing about that is whenever history repeats itself, it suggests we haven't learned any lessons, right? So maybe what we need is to take a new approach to some of this research. Um, 
as I was listening, one of the things that I, I think is really exciting about the opportunity we're at now is especially emerging from the pandemic where a lot of governments were forced to reckon with, on the one hand, the absolute um, essential and sort of central role of digital technologies in our lives, um, which has you know predated the pandemic, but it was easy for governments to ignore. And then the second was that a lot of governments were forced to reckon with their lack of digital capacity, right? Like whether it was inability to do contact tracing or to set up vaccine scheduling services um, or even to be effective public communicators in kind of digital platforms. So all that to say, there's this inflection point where it could be a, a great opportunity to reinvigorate the role of civic tech in government and really strengthen those relationships and to do it in a way that avoids all the pitfalls that our, our three opening speakers really like eloquently laid out for us. Um, what I think would be really helpful in terms of research to drive this policy work would be very vivid case studies that illustrate to us sort of um, where these kinds of partnerships can work very well. And then also when they're not working well, why? Like what needs to change in government in order to facilitate? And I think that if they were written in an accessible way and had were very helpful examples. I actually think you could capture the political imagination in a way that, you know, there is this, there's clearly an appetite, I think, amongst political leadership to think creatively about um, service delivery and to improve services. And there's all, the, whether you're on the right or the left, there's excitement about working with outside partners for a whole range of reasons. So, um, you know, I think that we've kind of got this, there's like a group of bureaucrats who really get this. And I think all of us can think of those like, Digi whether it's digital service teams or the people working in open data or those who were former civic tech kind of outside government and now in government, they kind of get it. Now they need to get their political leaders on board to deal with some of the larger structural changes that you've outlined. So um, one like space where I think some, you know, really interesting case studies could be done would be showing how, how a service that has never worked can suddenly work if you create space for um, outside partners to work in more agile ways with government. I actually don't have a lot of case studies that show that in really kind of clearly accessible ways that maybe you could put across the desk of the minister and say like, when your digital team, those like little upstarts in the corner that you hired five of who have tech talent, when they tell you that you need to change our budgeting processes because you undercut scope for user research because you set out deliverables early on in the process, like this is what we mean. This is an example of where it worked really well. And here's some like solid evidence of the impact on citizens' lives. And, you know, that could be, I think that would be really great. So I think it's incumbent on researchers to try to generate more of those case studies and write them up. Um, I have ideas for other research projects that, that, that like, as I was listening, I was just scribbling down lots of things we could do, but I'm also conscious that um, other people need to speak. So I'm going to hold off for now, but um, I'd love to come back to some of those other ideas as well. But that's my. Thanks so much, Amanda. That a very, very wonderful distillation, actually, of some of the things that have, that have been said here today. And I, I'm definitely going to come back to a couple of those points and, and maybe get some other some other views. Um, Gabby, I don't know if you would like to kind of reflect a little bit on on the things people have been saying here and anything yeah, you think might be useful in future or a good way forward or, you know, opportunities that, that have arisen uh, in the last few years? In research in particular, I'm guessing. But, um, you know, I think, I, I mean, not least of all because it's part of our sort of, you know, our, our political, what we view as political opportunity in South Africa is the ability to look at, you know, really deep dive into local government, um, very discrete community case studies. Um, not with a, vi a pure vision of scaling up, which is always that terminology that gets uh, used and abused um, quite, you know, by funders in particular, um, but, you know, for lesson sharing, whatever. And actually thinking, starting to develop a methodology, which is a little bit more honest about what the factors need to be considered in scaling up in terms of context, that there are actual methodologies or, or you know, that could, could exist, which would help you 
possibly on some level calculate, you know, opportunities from different civic tech projects, what needs to be looked out for if they wanted to be scaled into different contexts and those kinds of things, which I think is an immense opportunity, particularly, you know, in, in the region, with, within our region, there are a lot of projects that happen very, which are, tend to be limited to urban, um, urban highly connected environments because